starts now. Welcome back, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, happy 2021. Um, this is our 41st conversation on the TLC, and we are welcoming back Merritt Aho, who's going to talk to us about test planning and reporting tools and ways that you can safely peak with a sequential design and or um, ways that you can safely report um, impact. So let's talk about Merritt. Um, he's a charming fella. Uh, Merritt is the Director of Optimization at Search Discovery. He is the creator now of multiple free test planning and reporting tools with more coming on the way. Um, and he has built and or led testing programs at multiple locations, including uh, at Dell with E, um, but most recently at uh, Dun & Bradstreet and uh, prior to that Volusion. And of course, currently all of the clients he works with here at Search Discovery. Um, anybody who knows him knows he's a great guy who is there to ask, answer any questions that anybody has. He's just very uh, generous with his time and his um, academic uh, intellectualness. So he's, he's, a, he's a delight to, to chat with. Um, and uh, I put this on there last time and I have to keep it there because he's kind of my lightning in a jar. He's you know technically savvy and he understands the stats and the strategy, which when you put it all together, gets us these tools and calculators. So thank you for coming back, Merritt, and I will pass, stop share and pass the screen share to you. I don't think anyone can live up to that intro, but um, thank okay. you, Kelly. Uh, let's see, I'll throw the screen share here. Share the right one. Okay, so we got a lot on the agenda today and um, I, gosh, it was a couple months ago, I presented on version one of the calculator that I'm gonna to share today. But then recently I've had uh, a couple other projects uh, that I've been working on, we're gonna share those as well. So not gonna go through as much of the theory and not into nearly as much detail on any one of the, the applications today, um, but gonna walk through some of the new features and point you to the last session that we did on the on the one of the sequential test calculator if you want more of the theory and and some of that stuff. So you should be seeing my screen now. Um, and I'm probably gonna stay out of presenter mode. I don't know if it's just me, but I, I don't like presenter mode as much. Um, okay, so if you ever used um, B1 of the calculator, it's what you see on the left, B2 is on the right. Uh, just a quick list of what's new here. Uh, and we'll go through these new features in a little bit of detail. And we'll go through why you would want to use this and what it's for as well. Um, so new, you've got a plot of power by effect size, um, which also includes a non-inferiority margin if you're using that for non-inferiority testing. We've got, we're plotting now expected duration by the effect size. Um, and those are both useful tools for planning. We'll talk about how. There's support for multiple testing. So if you have multiple metrics or multiple variations, I'm gonna say kind of support because you don't get the full support of the calculator, um, but you do get some. And um, there's also now configuration shortcuts. So you can save your work. I promise you I'm the number one user of this application and I found it to be quite a pain to go in and enter results multiple times as I was uh, analyzing tests. So that one was for me, but hopefully it serves some, for some of you as well. Um, and then there's some auto adjustment of boundaries to sample sizes. That was one thing that, uh, that could be kind of a pain in the last one. Um, we have some flexible inputs on tracking your own traffic. It's useful for estimating duration. And you no longer have to enter in percentages for when you want to do your check-ins. So we'll get to all those. Um, just a quick note on fixed horizons and peaking. Fixed horizon testing is the testing that uh, a lot of us are kind of accustomed to. That's where they tell you, don't peak. You're going to mess up your uh, error rates if you peak. Um, but as we know, there are maybe a lot of reasons why you would want to peak, why you would want to run tests that are as efficient as possible, right? Reducing the project length, launching other experiments that you have queued up, limiting the exposure of a potentially poor experience, right? A lot of us will check results early on to make sure that we're not doing a lot of harm and then we'll ramp up our experiments. Um, or, you know, the opposite, monetizing the uh, valuable change in your data. And then there's, there's always the stakeholders that um, don't understand testing well and, you know, they may even have access to the results and they see something that looks very strong and, and promising and 
they're looking at you like you're an idiot. Like, of course, this is a good thing, or of course, this is a bad thing. Why are you not acting on it? And so it's, it can actually be quite difficult to keep peeking out of the, of the scenario. Uh, of course, the downside to peaking, uh, and I'm illustrating that a little bit here, is that your false positive rates go up. Um, and you can see how just how much they go up here. If you were to peak at your test every 10% of the sample size, and you started with a 90% um, or a 10% false positive rate, right? 90% confidence level. Um, you're going to end with a 30% false positive rate, and that's at a zero. That's at a, a zero difference between conversion rates. So uh, it can be quite a big deal, uh, especially if you're testing, uh, if you're running quite a few experiments. So sequential testing allows you to peak. Uh, what it does is it adjusts your um, it, it adjusts your it's called a decision boundary, right? But whereas before, um, you know, your you might have looked at a p-value of less than 0 0.05. Um, in sequential testing, we usually don't go all the way to the p-value. We usually use the test statistic or the, the z-score in this case. Um, and we just adjust our threshold of where that test statistic has to land in order to be considered statistically significant. Um, and it, it sort of makes like a, a V pattern. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. So I'm going to, um, Kelly, have you pasted in the link to the calculator? I don't know if you mind doing that in the Slack channel. I think it's in the no comments here. Yeah. It's in the planning channel of the Slack, but I will grab it and put it. OK. So I'm, I'm just going to walk through some of the concepts step by step, because it can be a lot if you're trying to take it all in at once. But then we'll jump over into the calculator, and we'll kind of walk through what each of those are. Um, so step one of a sequential test design is like any other test, still like any other test, where you're deciding what your confidence level is, what your power is. You're selecting two tail or one tail minimum detectable effect or effect of interest, non-inferiority margin, if you want to select that, uh, and a base conversion rate, right? So those those are, that's par for the course, right? We're all used to that. Yeah, I'm gonna show, I guess this is Okay. Good. Okay. Um, step two is where the sequential part comes in. So at step two, you have to Select how many analyses you're gonna. You got to plan how many analyses you're going to do during the test, um, and then directly next to it, you get to see the impact that those analyses have on your sample size, because that is the essential trade-off that you're making with the sequential test. Your maximum potential sample size increases. And we'll talk about how that really shouldn't be a concern for you in just a moment. Um, you know, one of the features here is we're, we'll tell you what you should expect your sample size to be, or what it will be on average given different effect sizes, but the maximum potential sample size does increase. And so you can see here for, if I'm doing four check-ins and the more check-ins you do, the more it will increase your max sample size. Um, it, it, it usually doesn't get too extraordinarily high, but here you can see you're getting a 10% increase in maximum sample size with four uh, total analyses. So three interim analyses and one final analysis. Okay. Um, one of the new features here is a power plot by different effect sizes. And it's really useful for MDE selection, in my opinion. So it may look overwhelming. There's a lot of lines on here. Um, I broke this down to only show two planned analyses, uh, just to kind of simplify. But there will be a red line and a blue line for every checkpoint that you have planned for your test. And what you see here is you've got uh, the y-axis is probability, the x-axis are effect sizes, and these are relative effect sizes. So like 10% uh, increase in conversion rate, right? 10% increase conversion rate over 10% would be an 11% conversion rate. So these are these are standardized, or these are moved down to relative increases. Um, and what you get is at each checkpoint, you get a probability curve. And that probability curve is the probability of crossing a decision boundary, and you have an upper boundary and a lower boundary. The upper boundary is when you say, typically is when you say like, great, I have a winner, right? It's when, it's when you can end the test because you've, you've uh, determined that you've got a winner in your hands. The lower boundary is typically your, your futility boundary. 
And that's typically where you say, well, this is looking poor enough that I'm just gonna give up now. Okay, so what you get here is you get a, a curve for each boundary at each checkpoint. And what it's telling you is, what it's plotting is the, the likelihood of crossing that decision boundary given some effect size. So at what we don't know in testing, right? The, the hardest thing in testing is we don't know what the effect size is. And that's why MDE selection can be so difficult uh, because we have so little information about what the actual impact is. That's why sequential testing becomes valuable because it allows us to act on results that are more extreme than we anticipated. So um, the illustration here is, okay, if the true difference in conversion rate is 15%, how likely am I to end the test at the first checkpoint? So I go over here and I find the first checkpoint. It's a solid line, uh, the effect size of 15%. And it looks like that's about a 58% chance of ending the test at the first checkpoint. Okay, so that's how you might want to use this. And, and you might want to look at, you know, okay, so I'm, you know, picking an MDE. If I'm off in that MDE on the low side or on the high side, how likely am I to get a false or a, um, you know, a, um, a statistically significant result at each of my checkpoints? So that's kind of how I use this. I use it as like a gut check on my MDE selection um, to determine if I've got like a design that's really going to be give me a shot at getting a, a, a positive result. Now, the, the sister chart to this, oops, sorry, there's one other feature in here that I think is really useful. And that is using this to understand the uh, non-inferiority test design. So as I mentioned, you can choose a non-inferiority margin. And what that is, that's a margin of, it's a relative uh, percentage below the control conversion rate. And it's, it's really hard to conceptualize non-inferiority testing. At least it was for me, and I found it's, it's really difficult to get people to understand this. I feel like this could help you see that because as you enter in a non-inferiority margin, what you'll see is your, your power curve will change. And so in the one that we're looking at here, I apologize, it looks a little small to me. So I'm going to pop into presentation mode and hope it zooms in a little bit. Okay, so what you see here is we've entered in a two and a half percent non-inferiority margin. Now, if we think about like at the end of the test, right, let's look at this dotted line. What we should see is that the probability of a positive result of, process, of crossing the efficacy boundary is equal to our alpha or one minus the confidence level. So it's a 95% confidence level. So it should be about 5% at, at the minus two and a half percent mark which is about right here. And you can see that's 5%. So what this, what this helps me to understand is that when you do a non-inferiority test, you're shifting, your, you're shifting the place where, um, where your alpha is true, where your type one error rate is true. And then what you can say is, okay, well, what if it's actually flat? What is my error rate there? And you can see here, the true difference in conversion rate is zero. How likely am I to call it a winner. And maybe you want to call that a winner. Maybe you don't want to call that a winner. But you, either way, you can see that that is about a little less than 15% chance of calling that a winner at the end of the test. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I don't under, under, entertain any delusion that uh, everyone understands non-inferiority testing. It's not, it's certainly not an easy concept, um, but hopefully it's one that you can kind of explore and play around with a little bit here as you see the power curves and the implication of selecting a non-inferiority margin. Um, let me get out of here. Okay. The next plot um, is a duration plot. So this is expected duration by different effect sizes. So the same construct of effect sizes here in relative percentages. Um, and it can really help you have better expectations about what the duration of the test actually should be. So I shared the little component up here where you get the fixed horizon, what it would be estimated duration. You get the sequential test max duration, but then what would the, what, what should you actually expect the duration to be? So what you would say here is how long would the test take on average if the true difference in conversion rates is 15%? And so you would just go along here to 15% difference in conversion rates, 
go up to expected uh, duration and you get sample size on the left and you get days duration on the right if you have put in some historical um, traffic information. So, and you can see here that even at its highest point, right, it's still, uh, it's still not too bad. What was this? Uh, Eight thousand. So that, that should be that should be twenty one thousand right here. This line, right? Your fixed horizon is twenty three thousand. So, on average, it should it should always be below your fixed horizon test. Okay. Uh, the other thing I. I think we're, we're closing the end of the, uh, the, the slides here so we can get into the actual calculator. But the other thing I wanted to share was the multiple comparisons corrections. So um, this is tricky to fit in because it'd be a lot of information to project out. Um, and it would, it would really, you know, to get all of the functionality that we have in here uh, for multiple comparisons would maybe be too much. But what you do get is you get a you get a table of upper boundaries for each metric that you want to track uh, and for each checkpoint. So the way the whole method works for multiple testing correction is it actually ranks your, it, it ranks your p-values or your z-scores. So your z-scores would be ranked high to low at each checkpoint. So if you have here, we're showing six variants. Um, so you would rank those high to low, and then you would use an adjusted decision boundary to evaluate each of those z-scores. So this would be a little bit manual for you. The calculator will tell you what the z-score is if you put in the data, but then you're going to have to go in here and manually compare these to each other. Okay, so what you would do is you'd say, okay, my highest z-score at checkpoint two, it needs to be at least 3.14 for it to cross a decision boundary. And if it's over 3.14, then we say, okay, that's a winner. The second Z-score, or that's a statistically significant difference in conversion rates, right? The second highest Z-score, if it's higher than 3.1, now it's lower than 3.14. So it has, that's the way the, the whole method works as opposed to the Bonferroni method, which just kind of like, increases the threshold for, for all of them and sets the same at all of them. Um, the, the home method is a little bit less conservative that way. So I, you know, if there's anything that's really maybe confusing in the calculator, this is probably one of them. Um, but you do, you will have to rank your own z-scores. I don't have anything in here that will do that for you. Got a question for you, Merritt. Actually, I don't have a question. Tim Wilson has a question. You're ranking the variance and their results at each checkpoint? Yes. Well, just, just the results. I mean, the, the variants are ranked by the results, right? So you would calculate the z-score for each variant, and then you would put those in rank order. And re-ranking at each checkpoint? Yes, re-ranking at each checkpoint. Yep. Uh, second question. Uh, how well does the sequential design calculator work for small MDEs? Same with um, non-inferiority margin. For example, I've got a large conversion rate, but a small MDE, like less than 1%. I mean, you can you can play with it. There's, there's no reason it wouldn't work, right? Um, I can't think of a reason it wouldn't work. Awesome. I don't know if you have more. If you have more on that, I'd love to hear it. I, I don't know. Maybe there's something I don't know here. Whoever asked that question, if you have uh, more details to the question, or if you've played around it uh, with it and have specific questions, let me know. Okay. The final thing I'm going to share here is the configuration shortcut. I mentioned that this will save your work. So what you get at the top is uh, you get a a text string. Um, that has all the details of the results that you've entered, you know, the full configuration, and you can just copy that text string and set it aside. And the next time you come back to the calculator, you can just paste that text string in and load the shortcut. Uh, now there are a couple things. Uh, this calculator is not 100% bug free. Uh, so for example, if you enter in results and then try to change the configuration of the test, which you should never do, um, it may break. 
uh, working on some working on some validation stuff and uh, and error error logging and stuff like that. But okay, so let's jump over to the calculator itself, and we'll just walk through a little bit of this scenario here. So I'm running this out of R. Um, and by the way, I, I should have said this sooner, but this whole calculator is built on an R package. So if you, and um, I have the calculator up on GitHub, so I, I can paste that in afterwards. You're welcome to go, um, you know, pull it down and um, and even branch it if you want. I'm, um, yeah, so it's the, the R package behind it is called GS Design. Um, and it actually has a, an expansive range of capabilities that I'm not using here. I'm just kind of trying to work it down to most common scenarios. Uh, maybe in the future, next, next iteration might have some more advanced configuration options, like changing the shape of your decision boundaries or the conservative, how conservative they are. Um, okay, so here's the full thing. You can see it starts with the configuration shortcut if you want to load that. Uh, as I mentioned, the basic configuration details. Um, the other thing that you can get here is if you want to put in current traffic volume to the test area um, and conversion volume to that area, um, it'll, you know, you can get your, calculate your standard, your base con conversion rate, and then use that in the test configuration. This data will also be used to estimate the number of days down here in sample size comparison and in the plot estimated duration in days. Um, so like if, uh, you know, 10,000 visitors is, you get that over seven days, eat up that to 30 days or whatever, and it all, all those estimates will change. Um, there's a help tab here that just kind of defines some of these inputs for you, has a little bit of information. The multiple comparisons tab, it defaults to nothing, right? So until you start putting in additional, actually that should be a minimum of, uh, of two variants, but you start putting stuff in there, you get the recalculated boundaries. And then there's a whole bunch of tips in here that are worth reading at least once to go through a little bit. I was expecting this question. Uh, Beryl wants to know, will uh, revenue metric calculation be on the roadmap? Will, yeah, continuous metrics. It is on the roadmap. Yes. I just need to get around to doing it. Somebody needs to find time for you to be able to do that. This has been this has been a passion project. Uh, so, yeah, nights and weekends. I've, I've told Kelly this. My wife wants me to find a new hobby, but <laughs> I really like this hobby, though. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's fun. Okay. Um, so yeah, continuous metrics. That's a that's a big feature. Um, we'll get that going. <laughs> nice, Tim. <laughs> Kelly's my manager, folks. So, you know. Um, how many times do you want to peek? Yeah, so this is where you select uh, your the number of checkpoints you're going to have, right? That will change everything here. It'll it'll rework the plots, the power plots. As you, as I mentioned, the power plot does get more unwieldy the more analyses you plan in there. So um, apologies for that. Maybe maybe someday I'll think of a way to. Uh, set a threshold and only take the last one, uh, the last curve. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing that's in here that we didn't go through is entering in the results. So without entering in any results, there's some placeholder data in here and you just have to, um, you, you can just like overwrite that or clear it out. But you get the decision boundaries here. And if that's all you wanna use this for is calculating your decision boundaries, you can do that and, and walk away and be done with the calculator. That's kind of how the, the original design of the calculator was set up to be, is to just take, a, take your decision boundaries and walk away with the design. Um, but you can also enter in results along the way and it'll calculate a z-score. And then the only thing you have to do is you have to select which checkpoint you're entering these results for. So if it's the first one and um, you know, clicking the link here will add it into the table and also add it onto the results chart. So the way you would do this is, you know, let's say we're at the second, oops, second checkpoint here, and we're at 230. Okay, we already have one checkpoint entered in. Let's enter in the second checkpoint. We can see the z-score already. It's 1.53. So you could like manually come over here and compare it. 
or you could plot it and it'll punch into the uh, into the chart. Now, one of the things I mentioned is auto correction of the decision boundaries. So the default design just evenly spaces spaces out your checks, your check-ins. But if you've tried to do sequential testing, you realize that it's really hard to like actually time your check-ins to the planned sample sizes, um, at least in in digital testing. Um, but um, yeah, this will automatically reconfigure those those check-ins to um, to when you actually perform them and rejigger the um, the boundaries to align with those check-ins. This is really useful in scenarios where you have stakeholders that are like, I want a read every Friday or twice a week on Wednesdays and Fridays or whatever the case may be, so that you you don't have to decide up ahead when those are and then wait for that exact sample size. It automatically does it for you, which is really nice. Now, I just entered in some new data here, right? Um, it looks like there's an 11% difference in conversion rate. So the total sample size at this checkpoint is gonna be 16,000. And if you look at the plot on here, that's a little bit further than our next plan checkpoint. Um, and the Z-score to beat there was 2.34. So it actually could be really close, right? So we're gonna add these in as the third analysis. And there we go, we actually crossed the efficacy boundary. When you cross one of the boundaries, you'll get um, you'll get a message that pops up here saying you crossed a boundary. Um, the way this is configured, the efficacy boundary is what's known as a binding boundary. So when you cross it, if you want to maintain your error rates the way you planned them, you need to end the test. The lower boundary is programmed to, at least for a one-tail test, the lower boundary is programmed to be a non-binding boundary. So if you cross it, you can decide whether or not you want to continue testing or not. Um, of course, continuing to test when you cross the lower boundary will increase your power or reduce your type two error rate beyond what you had planned. Um, if you cross the efficacy boundary, you will also get a, um, a confidence interval. This is an adjusted confidence interval from what you would get if you just went out and did a, a standard calculation. Um, it's intended to control for some of the bias. Um, my lived experience is that it, the adjustments to the confidence interval aren't hugely dramatic, um, but uh, I, would, I would take this over, uh, over the basic calculation. So I'm gonna stop there. I guess we're at least halfway through this show um, and we've got two other calculators to get through. Anyone have any questions before we uh, talk about some of the others? One thing I, I did actually prepare in here was um, when you want to choose sequential and when you want to go with fixed. Um, my opinion here is that sequential is great if you're looking at a test duration longer than you know the minimum of what you'd want to test. So we recommend everybody that they test for at least one week, um, and you know maybe even two weeks is a good standard to set. So you get a couple of those business cycles in. Um, so if it's, if it's looking like it's going to be more than one week and, and you're concerned about the sample size or executing quickly, sequential is a great choice. If there's lots of uncertainty around the effect size, if you've got a really good idea for some reason of what to expect in terms of the effect size, then your fix um, test is, is going to be fairly efficient. Um, I mean, on average, you're going to expect the sequential test to have lower sample sizes, but um, not by a huge margin if you're, if you're fairly accurate with your MDE. Um, if you really want to be precise about your controlling your error rates, right? That's where, like, you know, if you're if you're peaking, I'm not saying that everyone who's peaking is making terrible decisions. Like you have, you'd have to do a lot of analysis to to determine that. But um, what this allows you to do is at least control and know what those error rates are. Um, if you want to take statistical measurements early on in the test, you know, 5% a sample, 10% a sample, and you want to do it in a very disciplined sort of way, not just sort of eyeballing the results and saying, okay, well, it's not tanking, so we'll move forward. Um, you know, this is a good way for you to do it. And if I would say if you have a tolerance for more complex statistics, uh, that is, I don't think that's something to be overlooked, right? There's, um, if you want to keep it simple, stick with a fixed design. Um, if it's not broke, don't don't try to fix it. If uh, if you don't need 
if you don't have concerns about duration or sample size, um, stick with what works for you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the, with the fixed design. Um, also, if you want to use the in-tool stats engine that's offered to you, um, you know, some of those stats engines are pretty sophisticated and very nice. Um, stick with those. And for now, yeah, you know, to the question of continuous metrics, don't support it for now in this one. Although there, you know, if you want to go ahead and do your own thing with the with the R package, um, you will find support for continuous metrics there. Okay, um, moving on. We'll call it a bonus because this is a, a fairly. Sorry, I do have questions. Uh, could you explain why the search discovery calculator shows a larger sample size for fixed horizon tests than other calculators, such as Optima? Oh, okay. You know why is uh, the Optimizely? Is it the power of the test? We also have an internal calculator at UBS where I control the power and the sample size results are very different for a fixed horizon test. I would be happy. I, actually, I'd love to look at those examples specifically. So if, if you could um, you know, show me how to reproduce the work, I'd love to look at them. Yeah. I can tell you that Optimizely's calculator is um, uh, on their stats engine um, and it does uh, default to 100% power. And yes, they don't do fixed horizon test. And so I should say that uh, Merit's calculator, while called a sequential planning calculator, is not true sequential design. It's more like utilizing methods of sequential test testing to evaluate a fixed uh, horizon test and then adjusting the back end stats to hold um, the same uh, statistical standards for each for the peaking. So it's, it's it's like the same methodology, but it's not the same as Optimizely's um, unlimited peaking, if you will. It is not the same as Optimizely's, yeah. And Optimizely uses priors too in the, in their test calculations. So they've, they've got a couple of differences. I don't know what that is, Matt. Ah. <laughs> I'm not following the chatter, but um, I trust it's entertaining. Continuous testing on the ah. yeah. right hit. Okay, um, so let's jump over to the other fun little project we've been working on. So new toy just for you. This is uh, hot off the presses. Um, the, the, the birth story of this little tool is I was working on a test analysis for a client and I was doing a visualization in Google Sheets and I was fed up with Google Sheets visualizations. So I was thinking, man, I should just, I should just do something that's reusable here in R. And so I started playing around and, um, and, and, and this thing was born. So we'll go through it. I think the only thing I want to pause and, uh, and explain you know, with a little more detail is there is a revenue projection chart in here, which uh, many people will hate and some people will love. And that is fine, I'm okay with that. So um, we'll talk about in a minute of why financial projections are really tricky and maybe you shouldn't even do them. Um, but I think it can be useful to just get a general sense of where the value of a test could lie. Um, so with, with this, you get some customizable analysis and you get the, you know, the, the other big feature in this calculator is some rough revenue projections. So what you would get here is what's the range of financial outcomes I might see. And you'll get this chart. I'm going to go to presentation mode again so we can get a little more detail. Um, what this is based on is the confidence interval of the effect size. So you take the confidence interval in the effect size and you you add to that the value of a conversion, which is one of the inputs in the calculator, and the conversion volume on a, on a monthly period. And then we, we extrapolate that out without a decay rate, right? So we're just saying like, if you, let's say this range of outcomes were applied to six months worth of business activity, assuming all of that remains stable, what's the range of outcomes you might expect to see? And what I'm plotting on here is the, the minimum value that you would expect to see. So you see a likelihood curve here, kind of like a power analysis. And 
you get on the low end, this is this is a whatever confidence interval you've identified there, and that's adjustable. You can it defaults to 95% confidence interval. And so you would see, you know, there's a 97% chance of it contributing at least this much on the low end, and that probability goes down uh, as you get to the high end. So 2% chance of contributing at least this amount on the high end. And then you get like an like an average where your 50% mark is. So I will jump again directly to the calculator. Pull it over from R. And there's no specific R package for this. It's just kind of using like, for the most part, base functionality. Um, so what you get here, you know, should be pretty, this is, this is fixed horizon stuff, right? This is not, um, although, yeah, this is this is for a run of the mill testing. Um, conversion rates for control and test. Um, you can choose your confidence interval that you're showing here, how many tails, and you can even add in a Bonferroni correction. It'd be kind of hard to do this with a home correction because then I'd be asking you for the rank and uh, I just wanted to keep this kind of simple. Maybe we'll add complexity on the road. Um, as I mentioned, you would put in the approximate value of your conversion rate and you can kind of pick any value. Like you can play around and see what the charts look like when you add a higher value or a lower value. Um, so you can just estimate that or you can use an actual average order value if you want. Um, and then conversion volume for the test audience or for the, the yeah, for the, the audience you're talking about in a month. That's kind of important that you, you're not talking about like your full audience, but whoever the test impacted. And then there's some customizations that are available in the report. Um, you can change the title to uh, my great idea. Um, you can change the name of the recipes, control test or, or idea, my idea, whatever. And then you can change the value, the colors that are used in here, which is kind of nice if you're, um, if you're wanting to brand this stuff and kind of use it in presentations. Um, you get a lot of calculations in here, a whole table of figures, uh, the standard errors, z-value, p-score, or p-value, p-value, z-score. Um, and then, you know, pretty standard visualizations for the most part. Um, your confidence interval on the difference here, uh, confidence intervals around each of the test experiences. Let me widen that up a little bit just so it gives a little distance there, appears a little better. Um, and then the revenue projection down at the bottom. Ooh, that's a great product request from Dylan Lewis. Add the ability to input the hypothesis to the report. Ooh, that is nice. I like that. Someone's and thinking. Too bad in when we're actually doing these uh, results analyses, we can't just, you know, tweak the difference so that our labels don't overlap. <laughs> I'm writing that down, Dylan. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Tim Wilson said, should we add feature requests as issues to the GitHub repo? Sure. Okay. There is a GitHub repo for this as well. Um, we can share that too. Uh, I, I actually, actually, before I share that, I may go in and comment. This is really fresh. Like I started working on this like uh, December 30th and, um, and I, haven't, I haven't actually cleaned up the code. So <laughs> I need to comment stuff out and leave a, leave a trail someone can follow first. Um, I'll get that done pretty soon. Okay, so um, how are we on time? We got a little bit of time left, right? Yeah, you're good. I mentioned that Revenue projections are a tricky thing and you wanna, if you're gonna tread there, you wanna tread carefully. Um, and it's a good, we even have a link to this here, but it's a good time to sort of revisit um, the revenue projection, uh, what are we calling it? The test yeah. results simulator that Tim Wilson, I should just call you out Tim to explain this, but um, I, I do have a couple of things that I just wanna pull out that, that will, um, make it a little easier maybe to take the whole thing in at once. So there, there's another app here that we're linking to. It's a test results simulator. Tim built it a little while ago. 
Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, I think the at the crux of it, there are a couple of concepts to keep your eye on. Trade too long to explain it, you're right. Um, and the, the first is, so this brings confidence intervals to life. So you, your main, some of your main inputs here is you would input a, what you would view a true conversion rate for both control and test. And then what gets simulated here is for some sample size, um, a confidence interval is create, generated around that true conversion rate. And then what gets simulated, and you can do like multiple iterations of this, is a sample from that, a random sample from that distribution. So whereas when you're actually looking at test results, you're looking at a sample and the confidence interval around that sample, here you're looking at what you would, might presume a true conversion rate to be and what you might see in a sample. And importantly, so, the true conversion rate of the control and the sample is completely unknowable. So we're pretending, yes. this is a pretend world. Unlike Merritt's calculator, which is your result, this is a pretend world that's a step, hence the word simulator. And, and what's good to see here is, <clears throat> you know, assuming some truth, uh, a, in this case, a 10% um, increase in conversion rates, right. um, what might you see? And, and as you generate these, you know, these will bounce around, you'll see stuff overlapping here and there, but it kind of gives you a good idea uh, it brings to life like how random sampling actually works and how tricky that can be. Uh, the other visualization before we jump over the calculator here is, um, you know, the actual lift and what your result lift would look like. And so you've got your result lift and then you've got a confidence interval around that. It's just a different visualization of it, right? Low to high. And you can see that the actual lift is actually very much on the low end of this one. So it's within that 95% confidence interval, but it's, you know, the true lift here is much less than what you would have observed in the test. So uh, we'll load this back up. So you can play around with this a little bit. And then what Tim has also done is he's also got an average order value that you can put in or a, a conversion value if you're not talking about orders. Um, and then he, he will actually, he'll run the analysis on this of what you would expect, what you would like conclude from seeing your test results and what the actual truth is. Um, so here's where you can kind of play with the conversion or sorry, with the sample sizes, um, run your simulation and it'll pop out if you would have gotten a false negative here you run the simulation over and over and over. And what it's doing, it's just sampling from that population. And this so is in every, go ahead. In, ev in every sample that it's taking, you know, the, the average, the true uh, conversion rates. <laughs> I think I just got breakfast delivered. <laughs> That was cool. Okay. Uh, pancakes, anyone? Um, <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so um, so it's sampling from it's it's sampling from that true conversion rate. So these are all you know feasible test results that you could see, and it's completely random what you would get, just like it's completely random what you would get when you actually run a test. So it's, it's highly instructive and with each, with each of those, you'll kind of see where the revenue projections would land. And every now and then you're gonna get a false positive and you're gonna see what that looks like as well. So kind of nice to have both of these tools side by side to, um, you know, it can be pretty instructive. So end of the day, revenue projections are, they're tricky, I mean, I guess, Test interpretation by itself is tricky. Hopefully these, these bring it to life a little bit for you. Um, I, think that's, I think that's it. I'm trying to end this early so I can eat these hot. Yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> you, you know, you've got to tell her that we were recording and that that's going to be on YouTube. So she's going to be right. famous. <laughs> I love that.
<laughs> That's a hope and dream to be a YouTube star. Absolutely. Who's who's got questions for us? Between we've got the uh, the test simulator, the test result report. Um, what is oh test results presentation, and then the sequential AV calculator are the three tools and calculators that we showed you today. You should have links to all of them, both in the ch uh, Zoom chat and in the TLC calls, and I think TLC planning channel. But if you guys have uh, any questions, Eric can answer, or Tim, we'll make him answer. Yeah, Tim, you should probably chime in. I'm sure I didn't do justice to the the simulator there. We could we could spend an hour on that alone. I think just playing with it. Well, I, what I had not figured out was to how to actually do a distribution because it seemed like I'd want to be able to run, can I run a thousand simulations and see the distribution, which is not in it. So I actually really like that you're, you're, you're showing the distributions. Yeah. So you're going to add that to yours? Well, With all that time. I have a different manager who's not just <laughs> Anyone else? I mean, I'll, I'll chime in. Like, Merritt, you said this, that, yeah. I mean, that this is, the, the simulator is purely a simulator, but in your sequential, you are kind of, you're plotting things based on what the, if the true effect is X or Y, right? There is kind of the true effect assumed within it and saying, given the various possible true effects. So it's, still unknowable, but it's, um, you're kind of getting a sense of that, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's offering you probabilities based on some truth. Some unknowable truth. And again, you're wrapping your head around, okay, if that unknowable truth is how close or far from my, the MDE that I set, what does that actually mean? Yes. Uh, um, Tim, do you want to, um, the intuition check that you posted earlier in the call, um, by the time I read it, we had kind of moved along, but I think it's kind of relevant to what you're talking about right now. Because um, if you're regularly setting an MDE that's above the actual effect, your average duration across tests could wind up being greater than if you went with a non-peaking approach. Do you want to unpack that a little? So I think if I was, this is going back to when Merritt, you were saying, looking at the, you know, on, you can do the sequential and on, on, even though it's going to say longer, larger um, sample size on average, you'd wind up being shorter because you'd be cutting it short. But if you are actually if you were kind of playing the game of trying to set an MDE that's ambitious again and again and again, then you actually would wind up, I think, living in the, on average, longer than if you just had a fixed horizon. So if all we had was a efficacy boundary, that would be true. But we are using a futility boundary. So that this chart of like the expected sample size and duration that is assuming the, pre the that you're making decisions based on the futility boundary as well so because there's a futility boundary you're going to end tests that don't look promising that don't okay. look promising in comparison to your mde yeah well uh, and, and so you can see here that like a zero percent difference between the two or even a, a five percent they're actually your your expected duration is going to be shorter because a bunch of those are going to cross the futility boundary and you're going to, you're going to abandon them early. Uh, okay. The futility boundary is nice because, you know, it, it does give you that chance to give up on something that doesn't look promising while still maintaining the power of your test. And that's what you ought to be concerned about with the futility boundary, right? If you, if you, if you're halfway through a test and something looks flat, you don't want to forego the chance that what you've seen is just, because you haven't powered it enough because you don't have enough right. power. Right. So you can kind of guarantee your power at, at those uh, shorter sample sizes. You're calling a winner early and you're calling a loser early. I think that was, that's the two colors. Ah. That's, that's the English. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Merritt. You have graduated into the requires translation. 
Oh, man. <laughs> I've been trying to fight that threshold my entire career. And <laughs> it's something of an achievement, I guess, but. It's definitely an achievement. Although I think Matt was born that way. Um, yeah, I was born that way. Tim, did you see Ian's question? I, I did. <laughs> I, I did, I did, and it is, and I'll post a response. The best way to find it is I, I get shared it with Merritt like last week or earlier this week. So I'm about to post the, it is in GitHub. I just have trouble finding it. Okay. And Dylan, you're, Dylan is true. He said requires translation, less than requires pancakes. All right, guys, um, I am going to, to wrap this up, though, if you have more questions, we're all happy to um, chat more on the TLC Slack or elsewhere. But one thing that I do want to say um, is that Dylan Lewis made clear to me that our next conversation needs to be really good because this was number, not that this one wasn't, all of them are great, but this was number 41, which means the next one is number 42 which is the answer to the universe and life and everything. So it's got to be great. So uh, if you all have topic suggestions uh, for the rest of January, I have several that I'm working through, but if there's any that um, are of particular interest right now, let me know and I'll get everything prioritized and scheduled and you all should get a slew of invites in the coming weeks. Thank you all. Hope you have a Thanks. happy weekend and a great new year. Yes, it was. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much.